Hello there. How are you? Do you see me? Do you see me? I see you. Do you see me? I see you. Excellent. There we go. Put a little more light on the subject. Okay. So, and I've been reviewing the materials you have sent me. Excellent. It says there's no bone on bone. Yeah. Bunch of ganglion cysts. Some fraying of the cartilage. Yeah. And they say that there's a cam type. What's the term again? Anyway, it's a congenital. They say congenital bone growth, and they say it's the and the top anterior superior aspect. I don't see it. I see it at the inferior underside, if anything. From the X-ray. Yeah. And so my question is, in what positions do you feel pain in the joint? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the left and the right are slightly different. And uh, for, yeah, the, for the right, right has less cartilage. Yeah, I think the, the right is a little bit more uh, worn down or whatever. Wait, wait, wait. I'm asking a specific question. Yeah. What movements make you feel more pain and where's the pain? So internal rotation is pretty tough. Internal rotation, okay. So, and that pain will come at the outside of the hip. Um, it's a very, very limited range of internal rotation. I almost uh, can't do it very much. If you know the side, the side, um, the side bend uh, somatic exercise, where you yeah, yeah. internally rotate the hip and try to get deep into the um, obliques. Uh, you know, my my legs maybe come up about this much, whereas I see other people who can do <laughs> large, large ranges like that. So that's, okay. I would say... That's the, not internal rotation. That's actually abduction. Okay. Um, well, there's I, an abduction. Go on. Yeah, I'm wondering if it's connected because, I mean, even just, you know, standing up and, and internally rotating in a standing posture can trigger that same sensation. Well, yeah, the term internal rotation I take to mean with a leg in a straight position, not a forward position, and then turn toes in or kneecap in. Mm -hmm. It's just to clarify use of the term. Sure. And with your less than three cat stretch, your knees are way forward, and so it isn't a pure internal rotation. And it's actually the abductors that are doing the action. Mm -hmm. Okay. But... Um, that doesn't mean anything so far. The question is, when you do the movement, do you feel a hard bone stop? Yeah, I mean, it it produces a sharp pain. No, that's not the question I'm asking. I'm <laughs> saying when you do the movement, do you feel a hard stop, like a bone hitting bone? Well, you know, that's I'm not exactly sure okay. how to name that. Maybe I do. I just... When Don't. you close a drawer in a bureau, you hit wood against wood, it's a hard stop. When you're, I, um, God, what's the counterpart of something that's squishy you're pushing together? Oh, I don't know. I'm going to have to wait for an example to come. It doesn't <laughs> come to mind. But you got the drawer analogy, right? Yeah. When you close the drawer, there's a hard stop. It doesn't feel mushy, squishy, or springy. It's hard. It's sudden. And it's sharp. It is sudden and quick. Yeah, I mean, well, there there is a there's, there's noises too, right? So there's a little bit of a grinding. Well, okay, and that could be because of the the ganglion cysts in there, uh -huh. rubbing against the surface of cartilage in an uneven way. Uh huh. Uh, but other times you get those, and it's just tendons that are twanging over each other. It's grunching through the movement. Yeah. But that's not the same as a hard stop. When would you got something they're talking about a, a cam? What's the term again? Well, anyway, it's an acetabular mm -hmm. femoral head mm -hmm. situation where there's a prominence of bone. They've talked about bone spurs, mm -hmm. which are growths that usually occur at the insertion of tendons that are tight and are pulling on and drawing the wrapping of the bone called periosteum. Mm -hmm in the direction of the pole, and bone grows along that line, and you get bone spurs growing. Mm -hmm. Ain't no such animal in the hip joint. Mm -hmm. 
So they're saying bone spurs, and I'm saying, well, okay, I don't understand that. It doesn't seem to fit the origin of bone spur formation. Mm -hmm. So what I'm asking you now is when you do the movement, do you reach a hard limit that is a sudden limit that is, or is it like muscles and soft tissue are interfering with further movement? But that would be more like a springy effect. It wouldn't be a hard yeah. stop. Well, maybe maybe a movement that's similar is just a, uh, you know, I guess hip flexor abduction sitting or like a knee to the chest yeah. type of situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Mine, mine probably comes about 90 degrees, and then it's really hard to, to bring it, you know, on its own will without pulling it with my hands anywhere past that 90 degrees. I see a lot of other people that can just, you know, so that, that might be, that might be where I feel it. And there is a little bit of a catching at that point. And, you know, if during that 90 degrees, if that internally rotates at all in that position, it's, it's pretty tough. It kind of just doesn't want to do it. Well, again, if you can pull it with your hands, then it isn't a hard stop. And okay. if it were, a prominence of bone that we're going into the acetabulum that is the cup of that hip joint, it would be hurt going in and hurt probably more the further you went in. Mm -hmm. If it's just like you can't bring it voluntarily, but you can do it with your hands, that sounds like a soft tissue interference. And you've got a history, you wrote it in, about doing splits and creating an effect, a muscle pull of the inner groin. Mm -hmm. That, if a spastic condition over time, will pull the head of the femur, the thigh bone, off center from its proper seat in the joint and will cause overcompression on the side toward which it's being pulled. Mm -hmm. And it will insult the cartilage and cause things like, they say, fraying mm -hmm. and breakdown. That's because the head of the joint isn't seated centrally. It's being pulled off and then is being made to move off-center. Mm -hmm. And that's an insult to the cartilage that it's pushing too hard against. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, differentiating between um, a hard stop and a soft stop, that first tells me whether or not it's a bony situation or a soft tissue situation. Soft tissue will be more springy and resistant, but not a hard stop. You'll be able to pull past it. And what about the what about the dull pain? So there's the sharp pain upon movement, or yeah. or I should also say that, you know, swimming, for instance, in a in a breaststroke where the kind of the frog leg type yeah. kick, um, that will trigger the sharp pain as well, and any sort of eccentric or quick inward, I guess, adducting movements. The the in general, the hip is very weak in that sense. Okay, that gets back to my initial question. What movements create pain where? You've just told me some movements, a frog leg movement, and you just told me something about that in adduction you feel pain. Is it straight leg adduction or knees forward adduction that causes pain? Mainly straight leg. Straight leg, okay. That kind of fits what I was seeing. They said superior or top end, and I looked at the films, and it looked to me like there was kind of a, a protuberance or thickening of growth on the underside, mm. and that would show up when you'd be adducting, like, looked to me like past the midline even. didn't seem like it would be in the normal range of motion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's where it starts to cause problems. Okay. Like, you know, past the midline. Well, okay. And you know, that could be, I mean, that, that sounds like it could be from the, the the bony growth past the midline. Just what I was looking at, that made sense. Yeah. The ganglion cysts, in my experience, don't mean anything. I'll tell you the story exactly. Mm -hmm. There was a client who came to me who had been told she had cysts in her hip joint, mm -hmm. and they were going to do surgery and scrape them out. Yeah. I, I looked at her movements, and I saw that she was way contracted in the musculature surrounding the hip joint. And so we did, it was probably one somatic education session where she got back control, the muscles relaxed, and the pain went away and she never needed the surgery. Mm. You got cysts?
They said, we need to clean it out surgically. I said, maybe. Let's find out what we can do by freeing you from excessive muscular contraction and joint compression. Mm -hmm. Did it. Pain went away. No surgery. Now, is it a situation, this is, this is a, something I'm starting to feel that I've made a lot of progress. I should, I should frame this by saying that I'm you know, now a, pretty much a completely different person than I was maybe like five years ago when this stuff was really bothering me. Yeah. But I'm wondering whether the presence of the cysts, the spurs, the fraying, whatever the heck, maybe some of the growth, whatever's going on, is kind of like an up, like a swimming upstream situation where I'll make progress, you know, then something will trigger the hip, possibly a bone or or <clears throat> related scraping. Then it kind of sends me back a little bit and just you know resets the nervous system and says, hey, by the way, there's something going on here. So I, I don't know if I haven't made the progress that I could have made if if the bone was smooth. Does that make sense? It's kind of like it a does. dialectic between it. Yeah, trauma reflex. If it hurts, you tighten up and cringe response. Mm -hmm. The telling test of it would be if you got to a place where all of the musculature surrounding the hip joint were free from trauma reflex and so just responsive to movement. Mm -hmm. And then if you started developing pains and cringe response, that would be a sensible test. Mm -hmm. But we don't know that. We don't know that you've ever gotten yourself um, well integrated in that musculature. So we don't have a, a basis for making an evaluation, a comparison. You never yeah. were in the free condition, or we don't know if you ever were. The fact that you could get better, what, do you had setbacks? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and, and you know, the being in the free or, or unres most unrestricted, maybe I've ever heard or extensive somatic sessions, and, you know, the, the range is pretty impressive, and I will, you know, be able to go back into some of the so, you know, like a straddle split or something like that with relative good internal rotation and that sort of thing. But mm -hmm. even then, I feel if I, you know, make the movement where I'm coming across the midline, no matter how relaxed it is, there still seems to be um, just something that it bumps up against. So that's, yeah. that's well, kind of what Well, if the labrum is me. frayed, if the labrum is uncomfortable, then going in movements that... <clears throat> that um, create compression mm -hmm. at those locations, if they're afraid, they're probably irritated. Yeah. And that could account for it. See, we don't know. We have the combination of frayed labrum, some mm -hmm. thinning on the right side, ganglion cysts, mm -hmm. all of which are changes to tissue to make it more irritable. Yeah. And if it's a muscular condition, which could be just from that incident you described of doing leg splits and creating, um, I think you called it a muscle pull yeah, in the groin, well, you know what? That can be it. That could be sufficiently an explanation for the fraying of the labrum and the formation of the ganglion cysts mm -hmm. without it being the fault of the bone at all. It could be. Don't now, have enough information to say. Yeah, you know, the, the original email I sent you was actually about the foot. So I wanted to bring the foot into the discussion. Um, mm. I do have memories yeah, of the yeah, relatively low low arch or flexible flat foot. Um, you know, I was just thinking leading up to the call, I do have memories of my early days of getting into martial arts when I was relatively injury-free. Um you know, I had a history of running uh, when I was in high school and other types of, you know, soccer and baseball and, and had honestly never experienced an injury um, until getting into martial arts. But even in the early days, around like 19 years old even, that, you know, the, the hip flexor stretch of, of laying on the ground and pulling your knee into your chest was something that they would have us do. And I remember never really being comfortable in that position and always feeling like it was, I guess, like a, a pretty much the same thing, a painful response unless I rotated it outwards and then I could kind of get it up. But 
there was something there that I didn't really know how to understand at that point. So I'm wondering if... Yeah, let's stop there and not change subjects, because I want to address it. Yeah. When you brought your knee to the chest, you said discomfort. Where? I mean, same, like the, the outside of the hip. Outside of the hip. Well, that doesn't make sense. Sort of I could in- see it being the front of the hip. Yeah. Because that's where the bone is entering into the acetabulum. The outside of the hip? No, I could I could see it if you were moving your leg laterally in a wide split with the legs in a straight position. And if you were, if you had uh, excess bone and it was entering the acetabulum, then yeah, I could understand that. But need a chest and hurting on the side? No, that doesn't make sense to me. That uh, for, in terms of something to do with the joint, I could see it in terms of a muscular situation. Mm-hmm. Certain muscles are contracted, the tensor fascia lata, Mm-hmm. The gluteus medius, and if you had cramping there, and you were in contraction, and you were forcing a stretch beyond what you could let go into, yeah, I could see that. That would make sense. It would be more toward the posterior, the back side of the hip joint, not strictly the lateral side. Well, you know, maybe I'm not describing. I was just actually doing that. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, it's. <clears throat> Yeah, it, it's almost a sensation that runs from the knee, the inner part of the knee to the, I guess, the mid top of the femur. So maybe the I was... Front, yeah, front side or back top of the femur? The front. like the, the front. Like the top of your leg, like right here. Yeah, okay. Well... So maybe yeah, I know, could... it's not describing it right, but... Okay, well, it could be, although let's see now, let the film show... What I saw was that the, the prominence of bone was on the underside. Everything on the top side looked nice and round to me. I didn't see what they're talking about Yeah. in the superior aspect. They also talked about some effect to the, well, basically the inguinal ligament. It would be the, the what was the term they used? Femoral inguinal. I have to review the, yeah. the report. But that suggests a contracted... Rectus femoris, which is a muscle that runs from below the kneecap up the front center of the thigh Mm -hmm. and then becomes what they call the inguinal ligament, Mm -hmm. which is not a ligament at all. It's a tendon. It's just extended, and it attaches to the anterior superior iliac spine. Do you know what that is, that term? Iliac spine? Yeah. It's the front bone thing. If you rub your hand... Yeah, along the front. That's it right there. And it attaches there. And then under that ligament run the psoas muscle and uh, some of the genital tubular stuff Mm -hmm. runs through that passage. And they said that was affected. Well, that suggests a contraction of the front thigh musculature, the femoris or femoris rectus. Mm -hmm. Hasn't been addressed at all, but it would, in the reports but it would affect your ability to bend, to flex at the knee. Yeah. If it were tight. Yeah. And if you were lying on your front and you bent your knee, you would find that your groin would lift off the surface. Yeah. It would create a fold, a frontal fold at the groin if that femoris rectus were tight. Mm Mm-hmm. So now we check. Do you have that? Um, so lying on the ground. Mm. So it's a general tightness. You bend the knee. Yeah. Lying on front, lying on your front, and at a certain point, when you bend your knee, your pubic bone lifts off the ground. Oh, you're saying so? You're, you're kind of contracting the hamstring. Or you could hold it with your hand and pull on it. It kind of doesn't matter. But if the femoris rectus is tight, yeah, then it doesn't have the ability to elongate enough to bend the knee without your pubic bone lifting off the ground, your top of the pelvis coming forward, uh-huh. being pulled forward by that tendon. Yeah, I mean, well, in general, the the I guess the musculature around the right hip in particular is, you know, more clumsy to respond and contracting the glute. Uh, produces pain in that front part that I think that you're just mentioning. 
Yeah, which that, that would account, be accountable f- by the front muscles, the gluteals and the psoas and the femoris rectus being tight. Mm-hmm. Then they would simply not lengthen as the posterior gluteals and, and the hamstrings tightened. Mm-hmm. That's all. It doesn't say anything more than that. Mm-hmm. If you tighten the front, then when you flex the back, the front resists and it feels tight and restricted and causes the pelvis to change position. Tops coming forward, bottom, pubic bone moving back. Mm-hmm. That's what it would do. Mm-hmm. So, that, And that would just be from being tight through there. It wouldn't have anything to do with the joint. Okay. So that the, the pain in the front... We need to distinguish whether it's pain out of the joint or if it's muscular pain yeah. from things that attach in that region. Yeah. A tight psoas tendon will give you groin pain. Yeah. Tight adductors will give you pain because they all attach along that pubic. It's called pubic ramus. It's the side of the pubic bone that goes back and up. Mm-hmm. And the adductors all attach there. And if they're tight, then that area is going to be irritable because of being pulled on all the time Mm -hmm. and will uh, have restricted capacity for leg abduction, namely splitting. Mm -hmm. And since you had that muscle pull during a split, Mm -hmm. that could be a culprit. Yeah. So the first and easy step is first integrate control of all the muscles of that region Mm -hmm. so that when you're at rest, they're soft and when they're you're active, they're responsive to you. Mm-hmm. And if you get muscles that are all nice and soft, and you reach in and you can push down and you can feel the neck of the femur underneath, mm-hmm. and you have the pain, then it's not going to be the musculature, the soft tissue that's causing it. Mm-hmm. Then you say, well, we got to look at the joint. Mm-hmm. But unless you can do the test with that region being free, mm-hmm. you don't have any conclusive evidence. Yeah, they're looking at static films that don't show movement. They're inferring from the shape of it certain things, mm-hmm. but it's not even three dimensional, so they can't even see the contours of it, mm-hmm. other than in two dimensions. It's like it's to me, it's very inconclusive, including the MRI. Yeah, because the MRI is again, it's not three dimensional, mm-hmm. and it's not in motion. It's not dynamic. Yeah. If it were dynamic, they could say, oh, look, when it happens and the movement is in this position, yeah, sure enough, that knob comes and that's exactly when the pain starts. Yeah, that's a pretty conclusive statement. Mm-hmm. But they're they're working from flat images, static images, in a situation where you have a history of a muscle pull and contraction in the region mm-hmm. that would affect the seating of the head of the femur in the joint. Mm-hmm. To me, it is way inconclusive what they're saying. And they even think use the word suggests. <laughs> this one of the female doctors, I can't remember her name, but yeah, know, it suggests. Yeah, okay, fair enough. That's a, a honest way of putting it. It suggests it. Yeah. As soon as you go in in the surgical situation, you're relying upon the surgeon as artist, yeah, sculptor, to reshape something that's weight bearing. Mm-hmm. while inflicting a wound to get in there, whether they're doing it arthroscopically or not. Yeah, that's a wound that prompts trauma reflex. Yeah. And sometimes it's necessary. You've got to clean up uh, fractured cartilage or the fragmented cartilage. Sometimes you've got to do that. Yeah. You know, it's like this trip typical of knee surgeries where you have bad meniscus mm-hmm. and you have crepitus and crunching. Mm-hmm. There's a difference between cartilage crunching and muscular crunching. Mm-hmm. There's just a feel difference. Muscular is usually like a twang or a snap. Uh, Cartilage is crunching like cellophane being crinkled. Huh. Well, that's what I'm. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to wonder because you know I've been doing um, just really gentle things, even like Pilates, like a gentle Pilates where they'll have you just um, really con- in a controlled way do the leg circles. Yeah. Kind of like inward and outward. And my right leg, it makes a lot of noise at, at various it, points in that circle. At the hip. Yeah. Joint. And it, it, mm-hmm. it, it, at times, it... Well, they it, said that the cartilage is frayed at the labrum. Yeah. So that's not that's consistent with frayed labrum and frayed cartilage. And again, that tip can commonly come from a, the head of the 
femur being offset from its centered seat, and then weight bearing going through a place that's not supposed to be taking the weight, yeah. and the cartilage, yeah, it's get rubbing and pressure, and yeah, it can fray, and and the fraying can lead, and fraying, by the way, is the kind of, the term implies kind of particularization yeah right it's not just a nice wear pattern yeah. it's a frayed pattern and that suggests that the cartilage itself may have like kind of pieces and loosenesses that get uh, mobilized as the joint passes across them in certain positions yeah so it may very well be that it may have nothing to do with the cam growth it may have just the fact that the cartilage is Mm-hmm. has been broken down by being offset from a prior injury pulling the head of the femur off its proper center as i said it's inconclusive yeah what they're saying and to me the first course of action the conservative one would be somatic education to get control of those movements so that there's no involuntary contraction going on mm mm-hmm. That, so that it allows that head of the femur to be centered in the joint and then see what kinds of symptoms and movements go together. Mm-hmm. And it, as I said, if you're free in the musculature and you still get those, it's likely the joint. And, I mean, just thinking through the surgery, which is something I've been reconsidering recently, um, how, <laughs> how bad is it? And have you had uh, folks you work with go through arthroscopic stuff even for the the knee or the hip and oh yeah is there recovery time you know helped by the somatics do they typically find better results not so much that the time is helped as so much as the degree of recovery yeah is helped that means that they may have a knee that couldn't flex very far you know it could get to less than 90 degrees something like 60 degrees of flexion Mm -hmm. And in that kind of, I'm thinking of one client in particular, and she had these long scars that looked like you could put a zipper there. Mm -hmm. The problem is the surgeons never organize the soft tissue. And organize means that it fits the way a sweater fits. And it isn't full of twists and bunches. It fits well and allows free movement. That's what we look for in the soft tissue. Mm -hmm. They didn't do a thing for that. They don't. Mm-hmm. That's not in their training. That's not what they're doing. You can't do it with a scalpel. You have to do it with hands. Mm-hmm. Physical therapists don't do it. Rolfers do it. Mm-hmm. People who are informed about soft tissue integration, who are competent, do it. Mm-hmm. So this woman had like some 60 degrees of bend. And what I had to do with her was a combination of sensory motor training and working in the soft tissue manually. And I, I was trained in that. Mm -hmm. So we got real good improvement. Mm -hmm. We didn't get the kind of mobility you get from somebody who hadn't had the surgery. It's not like she could kick herself in the butt with her heel. Yeah. But she had a a significant improvement. So the speed of improvement of recovery seems more to me to have to do with the raw tissue that has been surgically wounded Mm -hmm. growing back to the point where it all calms down and the circulation it comes normalized and the swelling goes away mm-hmm. and it's no longer raw tissue. Mm-hmm. That's what has to happen before we even consider somatic education. Yeah. Because otherwise the rawness of the tissue is going to hurt and cause trauma reflex and all the muscles around there will tighten up to protect it. Yeah. So I, as I say, I don't think it affects the speed of recovery. Tissue grows at the speed it grows. Yeah. But it does improve the degree of recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I mean, in my case, it's, it does, you know, it's not, obviously not that bad. It's more of a performance thing. Like I would, I would love to have a hip joint that doesn't make any noise <laughs> yeah. and that doesn't, I can just go swimming and not have to worry about whether it's firing a hundred percent or if it's in the right mm-hmm. position and that sort of thing. So I'm wondering, you know, going into the surgery, if I'm, if I were to do it, if I was relatively fit, which I generally consider myself to be, would it be a lighter recovery? Um, is it something where I'll, yeah. I will do the surgery and it will be like I will never be able to go back 
you know, I, w- I would want it to improve me rather than to sure. uh, kind of create this perennial thing that I would have to baby even more than my current situation. So given everything that you've seen and, and I guess where I'm at, what, what's your general take on that? Free the soft tissue first, somatic education to the point where you have good control of the muscles and nothing that is perpetually contracted. First step, that's conservative. Mm -hmm. And then see your condition. If all of that is free and you still have problems, as I said, I think it's in the joint. Mm -hmm. And they may need to do cleanup in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pre-surgery somatic education will certainly... Improve your recovery time. Mm -hmm. Brief story. Mm -hmm. Uh, A certain elderly woman that I knew had been through two hip joint replacement surgeries. Wow. At different times. Mm -hmm. And she was so contracted and the pain was so great, she said she didn't know whether she wanted to live anymore. She was like 89 or 90 or something. Didn't have much capacity for activity. So we did short sessions. I think we did three 15-minute sessions. The pain went away. Eventually, she got off the walker. She used a cane only in town. Mm-hmm. Okay, That's to say that post-surgically, you've got muscular contractions. Mm-hmm. They do not tend to go away, despite the hopes of stretching and such. Mm -hmm. But if you do somatic education post-surgically, you can wipe out the pain Mm -hmm. if it was a a surgery well done. Mm -hmm. There are some bizarre surgeries that are done. but I'm (laughs) only saying that to make my words more accurate. In terms of going into a surgery, if you're free of those muscular pulls, it's easier for the surgeon. Why? Because whatever Mickey Mousing around they have to do in there, Mm -hmm. they're not having to contend with these weird off-center pulls. Mm -hmm. Easier to do the surgery. Mm -hmm. Easier means probably a better surgery, too. Yeah. And then you probably, almost certainly, need somatic education post-surgically to wipe out the trauma reflex triggered by the surgery itself. Mm -hmm. So, summary answer... Find out whether you really need the surgery by removing the neuromuscular possible causes of pain. Mm -hmm. If the pain is still there, then it isn't from the sensory motor conditioning. It's not from the muscles pulling. Do the surgery. Do the cleanup. Easier for the surgeon because there aren't these weird pulls. Mm -hmm. So easier, probably a better surgical uh, result. And then do somatic education after to wipe out trauma reflex that the surgery triggers. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Um, yeah, this is my dilemma. How do you? How would you gauge that point that you just mentioned, where pretty much all of the the neuromuscular tissue stuff is accounted for, and then it's then it's a uh, you know that it's bone. Easy. Movement and palpation. Palpation is examination by manual touch. Mm -hmm. You stroke through the tissue. You can tell if you have contracted muscles, you cannot touch the bone. Mm -hmm. The muscles are in the way. The muscles are soft. You reach in. Yep, there's the greater trochanter. You reach in. You can sense the hardness of the neck of the femur Mm -hmm. to your fingertips. That's how you tell. It's easy. Mm-hmm. You reach in, you manually examine. Uh, do you know somebody in New York City who you would uh, feel confident could do that level of assessment? Yeah, Martha Peterson. Martha? Okay. Yeah, and the thing is that she's gotten into training practitioners. Mm-hmm. And she does a lot in Europe. So the thing is, you're going to have to coordinate with her when she's in town. She lives in New Jersey, I think, right? Yeah, I think, she, well, she lives in New Jersey, but she also practices, I think, in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. And I feel good about Martha. Okay. There's someone else in there that is certainly on the path, and she's got a good integrity. I don't know how her skills have progressed. This is and Laura. That's Laura Gates. Yeah, okay. Laura. I've worked with Laura a bit. And it was like I, the things that I do with people, I have not trained a lot of people in. Mm-hmm. 
like how to deal with the psoas and the hip joint flexors and such. It isn't taught in the basic training. I don't know how many people are competent in that, but I do know it's not taught in the basic training. Mm -hmm. I have trained some people in doing it because I was a presenter at a, a yearly convention. And I showed people how to do it and had them practice it. Mm -hmm. Whether they continued their practice, I don't know. I, how good they got, I don't know. I haven't seen them. Yeah. So, again, you work with Laura. I don't know what she did with you, how many sessions you did with her. We, so I can't have any further opinion. Sure. Yeah, we did a basic, like, you know, she was my first uh, real-life human being who was a practitioner, and she did a yeah. five, we did a five-session basic. She kind of brought me through the cat stretch exercises and clarified a lot of that, which mm -hmm. was great. And I did a couple classes with her. Um, but whether she did lessons one, two, and three, as we call them, mm -hmm. which are the green light reflex, the trauma reflex, and red light reflex, yeah. that would account for three. Yeah. There, and the hip musculature is accounted for in some degree by the trauma reflex lesson. That's for uh, rotation of the femur mm -hmm. with the knee bent position. But in terms of getting at the hip joint flexors, no, really not. Mm -hmm. In terms of getting at the posterior part, the back part of the side hip muscles, the gluteus medius, not really very well at all. Mm -hmm. Not really. There are other things I do if I want to get into that than the basic protocols. Mm -hmm. They're just not made for reaching those places that well. They're made for dealing with the central, stereotypical, common almost universal contraction patterns. Right. So I don't know what Laura did, but if she did five, it's possible she did the hip flexor stuff. I don't know from what you've told me. Yeah. But that would be a place you got to go. You've got to go in and do the uh, deep adductors, yeah. which do not get addressed in those protocols. You have to do something like I put in the, the regimen for SI joint pain. Yeah. Or in the magic of somatics, the side-lying maneuvers where you're lifting the leg by adduction. Yeah, I've done those. I have that. I, I did your... Did they help? Yeah, they were great. I think they brought me pretty far forward. And especially with the, um, um, yeah, the internal adduct, the adducting really yeah. helped me get a sense. And from the, uh, for your psoas stuff as well. Uh, so we're we're kind of coming to the end of our time here. Actually, we've <laughs> got a little further than that. Yeah, but we should kind of decide where we're going to go from here. Yeah, I don't want to keep you. Um, you know, I I think I'm going to get in touch with Martha and continue some of the the exercises that I've been doing and being a little bit more disciplined with those. Um, and then I guess we can reassess from there. Uh, yeah, I'm not like I'm not opposed to the surgery. There was a point where I was very resistant to it and just you know didn't want to mess around. But if it is a thing where it's just a you know torn up labrum that's not gonna go anywhere um, aside from that, then you know I, I would consider it. Um, yeah, there's a time for surgery. Yeah, and you know, I'm, I'm young enough that I, I would be hopeful that if, and it's, you know, the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York, they're apparently, you know, pretty groundbreaking in this stuff. Mm -hmm. I would hope that if they did it early enough, it would be in a good position for the future. Um, I know I know you're, you know, from the Integral and uh, other communities, that you're a pretty uh, broad thinking guy. Do you have any hope for things like, um, other types of regenerative medicine and including in that visualization uh, types of healings for, um, I guess, joint related or the labrum or other things repairing themselves. Yeah, the big deficiency in regenerative approaches is the muscular involvement that causes the condition to begin with. Mm -hmm. They do nothing to address that. Mm -hmm. I think injection of stem, stem cells and they're, they're injecting lubricants and cartilage cells. And I think all those are promising, mm -hmm. but not without addressing the sensory motor amnesia. Mm -hmm. It's got to be done to be intelligent about it. Otherwise, it's like one foot on the accelerator, one foot on the brake. Mm -hmm. 
You can't stop the brake wear if you don't take the foot off the brake or if you don't take your foot off the accelerator. Mm -hmm. They got to do both, in my opinion. I can't see any sensible alternative to that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, but first thing is deal with the sensory motor conditioning. Mm -hmm. If you clean it up and it comes back, that's an indication that there's trauma in that region and the trauma reflex is being triggered. Yeah. And which means probably the joint has got to be dealt with mechanically, surgery. Mm -hmm. um, one more thing before, yeah. before you run, uh, just because it's a, a lingering history that we kind of brought up. So the foot, <laughs> my, my kind of comical uh, question before about, you know, the, the picture of the foot with just like a really sound structure and arch and then the foot that's really, you know, pretty... Uh, I don't know what you would call it, um, not well integrated. What is the what is the difference? And I know that people have a range of foot types. Yeah. Give me some Look hope. for the I flexibility mean, of the foot. Can you can you change that or to what yeah, extent can you change? You can it? change it. Uh, to me, if I wanted to change flat feet, give a an arch, I would be doing two things. I'd be doing a second hour of rolfing, which is about the lower legs and feet, and reconstruct the foot mm -hmm. through the support provided by the soft tissue half of the game the other half is mm -hmm. the coordination patterning mm -hmm. because those arches are hoisted up by the muscles of the calf mm -hmm. there are two major muscles the tibialis anterior it goes down the front of the shin and it goes down to the inside of the arch and attaches on the underside of the foot and the other one is the peroneus longus, which is a side muscle of the lower leg mm. that goes uh, behind a certain prominence formed by the little toe as, it, as those tarsals move back. And it buries itself underneath the foot. Mm. And the two of those are kind of like the shape of a stirrup. And when they pull, they hoist up the arch. Mm. The foot itself should be soft, not hard. So it's springy. It's a shock absorber for yeah. walking. If those muscles are too slack, then the whole arch collapses mm -hmm. and there's no spring. If they're too tight, the arch hardens and the muscles, the bones of the foot get jammed together mm -hmm. and you get a bony looking foot. Mm -hmm. Those muscles must be responsive and resilient. And part of that has to do with the degree of turn of the lower leg. Mm -hmm. The lower leg turns at the knee joint, and if the front is turned inward, then the whole foot rolls to the inside of the foot and collapses. Mm -hmm. And that's from hamstrings not doing their job properly. Mm -hmm. The hamstrings turn the lower leg at the knee joint, mm -hmm. and they maintain the centeredness mm -hmm. of rotation of the tibia, of that lower leg. Mm -hmm. And that causes the foot then to be in a certain centered position, not too far in and not too far out, mm -hmm. and responsive to the shape of the ground you're walking on. Mm -hmm. If your ground is lumpy, the foot's got to be soft enough to conform. Mm -hmm. If you're walking on a sloped surface, you expect yourself to be walking on one edge of the foot more than the other. And the musculature has to be adapting your foot to the shape of the ground. So, yeah, you mm -hmm. can change, you can improve, tremendously improve the structure of mm -hmm. the feet. And just in my view, you've got to do it from both directions. Yeah. Good Rolfer, who does a good second hour, yeah. will have reconstructed your foot. Ida Rolf called the feet the first challenge. Because <laughs> everything is supported by the feet, their shape, their springiness, and their fit to the ground mm -hmm. or the shoe. So yeah. it can be or is that, kind of just a, is that just a mm -hmm. cop out? I mean, people say, you know, you, you inherited the flat foot. Is, is that. Yeah, that's a cop out. That's a cop out. Yeah, it's a cop. They don't know any better. Okay. If they knew better, they wouldn't say that. <laughs> it's just the genetics is the universal cop out. Everybody's, oh, it's your genetics. Now, the genetics account for some things. Okay. But they don't account for everything. Sure. 
Sure. They'll account for gray hair and wrinkles to some extent, although diet plays a part in that, significant. But they won't account for the stoop in your posture or someone's posture. Mm -hmm. Genetics does not account for those postural changes. That's helpful. Um, There's more that can be said about it, but it starts going kind of far afield in terms of <laughs> the morphogenetic field and all this other stuff. It's <laughs> not useful at this moment to talk about that. It suffice it to say, yeah, you can majorly improve foot function. Okay, great. And by the way, if the feet don't meet the ground evenly, yeah. if they're on edge one way or the other, then everything above is in a teetery-tottery condition. Mm -hmm. And the muscles of the pelvis tighten up in peculiar ways to stabilize that unstable situation mm -hmm. because the feet don't meet the ground properly. Mm -hmm. That pattern of contraction has effects in the joint, hip joints, the sacroiliac joints, and way far-reaching beyond that. Okay. So the, if the feet aren't sound, nothing above is going to be balanced and at rest. Ain't going to have no peace if the feet aren't at peace. Yep. Makes sense. Okay. Well, great. I appreciate it, Lawrence. Um, I will uh, continue my journey with the, ex the exercises that I do know. I'm going to get in touch okay. with Martha and have her give me a I guess, more hands-on assessment than I was able to get before. Yeah. Um, and I am curious if, if you have some secrets about the foot stuff. I, you know, I have done... Yeah. Do straight bent leg integration from the SI joint regimen. Uh-huh. Big deal. Yeah. That, the athlete's prayer for loose calves and the hamstrings. Okay. Okay. Clear enough. That's a good... Uh, that'll take you a good distance. Very potent. Yeah. And see if that affects your rotation of the leg, too. Because I had a report from someone not so dramatic as yours, a somatic educator who visits the Facebook page where I posted this, mm -hmm. came back and reported that it was very effective, that he got major increases of range of motion of leg rotation. Mm -hmm. Not surprising to me, knowing the design of the exercise. Mm hmm it was nice to hear someone say it. <laughs> well, I hope I hope to come back with a similar story. I, the, I think the length of the sequence is, has been deterring me, but I, I should just sit down and do it maybe tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah, the worst that will happen is you'll feel better. <laughs> you might get bored during it, but I, I don't know. I never get bored with these things. Once I get into it, I lose track of time. <laughs> Same. Okay. Thank so are you running a Mac or a, it doesn't matter. I can make the a recording of our conversation available through a an unlisted YouTube okay. uh video unless you don't mind if it's listed because it but it's not that's your call, but I can make it available in a secret um address and give you the address. I mean if it's if you think it's helpful to other people, I, I have no qualms about it. Yeah, because this is it, it answers questions that some people have mm -hmm. about hip about surgery and such mm -hmm. it answers very germane questions pre-surgery post-surgery whether you go for surgery the conservative step first before surgery you know these are all questions that are germane to a lot of people yeah that's that you have the green light Okay, swell. So I'll get on this once we finish the call, assuming that Skype recorded it as it appears that it did. I'll put it up to YouTube and give you the address. Okay, that sounds great. Okay. Thanks so much, Lawrence. Have a great evening. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Ciao.